Please welcome Bob Lefsetz and Bruce Allen. Thank you very much. Um, I see Bob. I, I've been sitting for half an hour with Bob in the green room talking about stuff, and we both cracked a sweat, so we're going to be in pretty good shape. He, he, he thought it might be an interview. I said, these people don't want an interview. They want a discussion. So it's not going to be an interview. If you thought it was going to be a one-on-one -on -one interview like old Ed Bicknell used to do, it's not going to be that. Now, he's, now he drops out a bunch no, of... No, that was just in case it was an interview. Oh. <laughs> I, I don't believe in preparation. Your whole life is in preparation. But I want to know is, if this was your gig, if Brian Adams was here, would you sell those seats in the corner? Um, as long as I tell him just to work that side of the stage a bit more, that's about it. But yeah, he sell them. Really? Would yeah. you sell them behind the stage? Well, he's sold behind the stage lots of times. It takes a lot, it takes, it's a hard job to do, but you've got to make sure you work back there. They're, they're d definitely discount seats, Bob. Well, many people in the business believe at this point the, the fan is being abused. With ticket prices, you know, the price of music, what do you think? You're a manager. Well, there's, no, there's no doubt about it. The fan is, uh, is, is abused by ticket prices, and not by ticket prices off the primary market. They're abused by tickets off the secondary market, and the problem is the fan they can sit there and be ready to go at 8 o'clock in the morning to buy their tickets. They can hit that computer at 8.01 uh, or two seconds after the thing goes, and there's nothing there except in the 40th row and up in the top deck. And that's just the way it is. And uh, I, I don't know how to stop it. I think fan clubs are a bit of a problem, uh, but record companies want fan clubs because they're gathering data. The secondary ticket market's very aggressive. There's hackers that can get in there now, we know, and, and getting, that, getting that stuff. And then there's a lot of people, I think, who just want a good seat, and they don't care how much they'll pay for it. They just want a good seat as long as it's guaranteed. And, and, and so you get passive about it. You say, well, I'll just wait, I'll get a seat. I'll get it on eBay, I'll get it from StubHub, I'll get it from one of these people. And I'm willing to pay $300 instead of 80 bucks to go see the act I want to see, but I want a good seat. And we all know there aren't that many good seats. Well, if you, uh, Winwood and Clapton played in uh, Madison Square Garden last week, and they had all those restrictions. We have to show up with your actual credit card, etc. But the tickets were still two hundred and twenty-five dollars. I think the tickets are overpriced. I think the acts are greedy. The acts basically say, "Well, we can't make any money on record sales now, so we're just going to fuck the customer up the rear end. Who cares?" Yeah, but but but, but if a ticket's two hundred twenty-five dollars and nobody wants to go, then I mean, the charge what the market will bear. Wait, wait, you're, you're just worried about your audience. You don't like those guys driving up to the BMWs with tickets because it excludes some people who are music fans but haven't got a career as a Wall Street broker. That's all you're upset about. Well, if you look at look at Dave Matthews Band, Dave Matthews Band usually charges forty-five dollars. He tours every summer in America. He's arguably the biggest act on the road on a regular basis. How can he charge so little and everybody be happy and everybody else says, "Oh, our hands are tied. We have to charge one hundred and twenty bucks." Because he's like, I, I'm much the same. I got Michael Bublé out there now. I watch Michael Bublé's demographic and I sit there and I say, now, if I can do, I can draw people 50 and older. But that's not all I want because there are kids coming up who like this music. I can't charge that much. So I'll keep my tickets down. I think, I, I, in fact, I'll tear them 85, 65, 45. I want to get people in there. Dave Matthews knows he can make money on that. We all know we can make money on that $45 ticket. He, he does big enough rooms, he sells them out quick enough, he hasn't got a big advertising budget, and he doesn't need to get rich in three weeks. But these guys, you're Eric Clapton, you're Stevie Winwood. Stevie Winwood is so happy for a $250 ticket he can't stand it, or else he'll be, because he'd be regular $25 in, in, well, you know, in a club. It's in New York City. If you talk to Jay Marciano, who runs Madison Square Garden, whenever they argue about the prices, et cetera, they'll say, well, what would your breakfast cost you in a hotel in New York City? Okay, which is insane. Well, it depends what hotel you I, stay. I still think, you know, I used to believe, you know, let the traffic you know, just determine the price. But I really find that ultimately, you know, we saw this with Seth Godin when he was writing on his blog, the presentation he did to Columbia Records a couple of weeks ago. You have to have a fan base. And if you don't have that fan base, you don't treat those people right. I agree that people will give you all their money. But the, I get email from people all the time saying that Neil Young went on the road for $225. Said I go to every show, $225, just too much. I think that when you're skimming on the top, okay, you have to find a way to get that, that the hardcore fan has to be able to find a way to get a ticket at a reasonable price. Okay, let's take a look. Neil Young went on the road for $225, and everybody I know who saw that show couldn't stand it because Neil Young says, I know you want to hear from this album, you want to hear Simon Girl, you want to hear that, and he didn't play them. I know. That's, that, someone, that's the ultimate arrogance. Yeah, well, it's like, it's right, like, exactly. It's like Van Morrison for $185 in Vancouver. $185 in Vancouver, never said thank you, never said his name, never introduced a guy in a band, never played the songs you want to hear, barely turned around, and just wheeled out and took the money. And don't think for one minute these guys don't know it, and I think they actually sometimes, in a way, get a kick out of it. These people just pay to see me, put the money in the pocket, and see you later. I, and I'm a huge Van Morrison fan. I doubt if I'd ever go again. I thought it was insulting. You know, everybody, how come it never comes back to me? Because I get an email all the time, people complaining about that exact same thing. I won't go anymore to Van Morrison, because you never know what show you're going to get. 
Same thing with Neil Young. You know, I'm not paying when I go to Neil Young. But you never know, unless he has a new album that week, you know, he'll play some of that stuff. You have no idea what he's going to play. So if you're spending that, that kind of money, by the same token, of course, if you have one of these acts, like the Stones, they're just going through the motions. Like my friend Jake Gold, the Stones played the Super Bowl two years ago, and they sucked. And everybody says, well, you have to understand, it's a silver dumb. That's where they normally play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, but then, of course, I thought Tom Petty did a good job. I thought Prince did a good job. What the fuck was Tom Petty doing at the Tom Super Bowl? Petty. He was just being Tom Petty. Wait, 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 Tom Here's Petty. Here's what happened. This is what happened to Tom Petty. Don't knock when you go in the Super Bowl. I said the same thing. I think he's like watching paint dry. That doesn't matter. He's got, he's got, he's got some hits. So he went on there. He played those hits. His, his downloads from the next week went from like 15,000 downloads a week. Tom Petty does his singles. Went to 63,000. He put his tickets on sale. As soon as the Super Bowl was over, bang, they came out of the box hard. He reminded people. It was a commercial to go on tour. Everybody got to see him and said, hey, I remember that. I remember that. I had to go see old Tom. Wait, wait, okay. let's talk about a completely different point. Let's say you were a fan of Tom Petty. Yes. For those people who don't know, Tom Petty put out a record on Shelter Records, and basically it was, it was a terrible label, broke in England, came back to America, had this song breakdown. But it took a long time, so we played clubs. I went to see Tom Petty the second time around at the Whiskey, which holds a couple hundred people, and then it's too tight, okay? That's the passion that gets me in this room at this particular point in time. The manager puts his hat on, they, you, know, you talk to Jeremy, you talk to what yep. about this. They made the Tom Petty movie, they're all excited about that. But someone who's a fan of rock and roll says... Wants to see him only at the whiskey? Yeah. Well, how's he gonna eat? No, 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 this is... What do you want to pay to I'm talking 1977! Okay, but you still want Everyone, Are you still living in Dreamland? The no, 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 you're missing whiskey? my point, missing my point. Let me finish my point. The point is, is that when the fan at home, and the Super Bowl has the best ratings of any television show, sees the most credible rocker still working on a regular basis, playing the Super Bowl, they say, I'm out. I'd rather play rock. Do you actually believe that? I feel that. I don't think so. I think people rediscover Tom Petty. I, I, I think I... Rediscover Tom I Petty? Think they, they, Who you forgot? Get, people forget. I forget. I forget. I mean, I sit there. I, I haven't seen Tom Petty. I haven't seen Petty for a long time. I forgot. You know what? You know what you, when, you, when Prince went up there and did the Prince thing, and right now, wait a minute. Let me finish. Okay? He just showed you what can be done. Because we had to go through the Super Bowl with Britney Spears. We had to go through the Super Bowl with all these bullshit acts. And all of a sudden, you saw this guy go up there, and he was great. And every and I wanted to go. Made me want to go back and open up my Prince records and hear that stuff again. It worked for me. And that's what Tom Petty did. And I'm not a Tom Petty fan. Okay. A couple of things. Prince is black. Different What's that culture, got to do with different culture, different thing. The rock values are a little different. Prince straddles the line. He started off as a rock act, then went pop, then different things. It's about the show. Prince came on and said, "I'm going to whip out my tiny little dick, and you're going to be amazed." Okay. <laughs> Whereas Tom Petty said, "Don't I look unbelievably old? Come see me before I die." <laughs> But, you know, there's a different thing. I think there was a whole different thing in place there. I think there was a whole different place in there. Thing there. I think Prince went out and showed what we're missing in the music business, and that's entertainment, okay? And I think the entertainment portion of the rock and roll business has disappeared. And I think people, I think that Tom Petty was a bore, but Tom Petty's always been a bore, but at least the songs were good, okay? That's the difference. Prince was entertaining, okay? I sit there with Michael Bublé. I sit there with Michael Bublé. We sold, what, 15 million albums and three albums. Okay, he's out there selling out tonight. He's selling out, uh, sold out St. Louis last night. He's selling out Kansas City tonight, 14,000 units. It's not because all of a sudden he came up with great songs. He sings great songs, but it's not about singing them. You can go see those songs. Lots of guys sing those songs, but it's entertainment. We take the entertainment quotient out of our business. That's what's killing our business, as, long, as well as many other things, but definitely the live business is entertainment. Elton John's entertainment. The plain white tees aren't. Okay, there's too many guys who are up on stage not doing a job, looking at their feet, playing their shitty songs, and, 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 and that's the end of it. Well, I actually think that's about something different. You know, the rock critics are people who never got laid, were alienated, and they champion these acts. I call them eunuchs in a whorehouse. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Uh, um, uh, what's that act that was on Letterman? The one with the guys who have day jobs? Vampire Weekend. Yes. Okay. You never get to hear Vampire seen, Weekend. Have you seen them live? It was like jaw-droppingly bad. Yes. If you listen to the record, it's like a bad imitation of Paul Simon's Graceland. And so the more that stuff is hyped, Thanks I agree with you. Thanks to the internet. I agree with you. This is their heyday, but the, the audience is tuned out. Short so heyday. I want to go back, though, to the Tom Petty thing. Not about the Super Bowl. My point about Tom Petty is, can't anybody say no? Shouldn't, shouldn't a manager tell the act, sometimes you got to leave the money on the table, sometimes you got to say no. I had an act one time. I was offered to do a guy's birthday party, six songs. 
for half a million dollars. I said, nothing, I passed on it. He said, six songs, half a million. He said, yep. Came back and two weeks later, he said, $750,000. I passed on it. Phoned back a month later, he said, a guy came up to see me, sat in my office, actually, with some of the money as a deposit, cash money, and said, how about a million dollars for six songs? At that moment, I thought I had to phone the act and at least ask him. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 uh, and, 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 and I, I phoned up the act and I told him this. He says, do I know this guy? I said, no, you don't know the guy. I said, but it's a million dollars. He says, you know, you ought to look into more of those birthday parties. <laughs> so I, so I, I, think it's just, I think it's just a point. You can imagine Dermot Quinn is sitting there at Warner Brothers saying, Take the job, take the job, promotion, promotion, promotion. Of course, it's the biggest marketing thing you can get. People are fighting for each other to sing the national anthem. The Eagles said no. Okay, they said no. Okay, but they got, they got other things where they make a lot of money also. They, maybe they didn't need it. And that would be horrifically dull, okay? Exactly. Okay, so, but, but Tom Petty was pretty dull. Yeah, but the Eagles are worse than that. So anyway, there is a point where you just are going to take the money. Okay, but you've got other forces at work. Okay, it's is for your on sale. It's setting up your on sale. It's setting up your record. It's setting up your Bogdanovich thing. Do you know how much pressure I'm on all the time? You've got to do Ameri Dancing with the Stars. You have to do American Idol. You have to do these shows. And you know what, Bob? Here's where you go wrong. You see, so you do them. You see a spike. CBS Sunday Morning, Today's Show, Oprah Winfrey. I mean, there's only about seven, eight, eight vehicles that can really sell records and see a spike. Letterman's gone. Leno, they don't sell records anymore. Kimmel, all that crap. They don't, they, they don't sell anymore. But there are shows that sell them. And I mean, what's our business? Isn't the artist business? That's my business, is to get the artist out there in front of people so people will get the music. That's why you want people to give away music free so people will get it. I'm, I'm trying to make a living here. You're happy, but some of these guys wait, are just wait, happy wait. having a job. Wait, let's go I back. Got, I'm building careers here. Let, let's go back a chapter, okay? Isn't it the major labels who ruin the record business by overexposure and jamming things down our throats? The major labels ruin the, la the record business by putting out crap. But we were, <laughs> but we, but we were, but we were complicit in that. Who, we, you, who's we? Artists, the who's artists. Me? We got one single, we got two singles, we got three singles, that's enough, now just fill it up with shit. I've sat in those meetings with Axe. <laughs> it's just not gonna be a single, who cares, who cares? We're on a roll here. Then they're screaming for their, their quarterly billing. That's what goes on. We, we fucked it up. We fucked it up. I'll take, it, I'll take responsibility for my stuff. I mean, and, 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 and the labels fucked it up too because they thought they, 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 just, they just put out stuff. They're on a roll. Everybody's thinking, they got five years, these bands. Five years, get as much out of them as you can. You know, that's how they you know, thought. I, I think everything you're saying is true. But how many more times do I have to see Beyonce? But Beyonce... Or they, Christina Aguilera. I mean, the point is, they want to make sure the person without a telephone who's still listening in wax cylinders is aware there's a new Beyonce record. You're talking about television. Exactly. But Beyonce doesn't no, the tour. Is, they believe the, the mantra of the, of the 90s is multiple messages. Yep. We'll get them on multiple morning shows. So, such that if you're either you're brain dead and miss it completely, or else if you're into something, you hear it again and again and again. I don't know if you know this, but Britney Spears has mental problems. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that. We've taken out the thing. It used to be I'd buy a record and we'd go to school. Now, granted, it's a different era, but the fan would sell the record. The fan would own the act. I think the business is so concerned with the money that they have, and you know, there's that great joke, you know, that we've all known for, you know, forever. There's, you know, the Papa Bull and the Baby Bull on the hill, okay, and there are all the cows down there, and the Baby Bull says, let's run down there and fuck one of those cows. And the Papa Bull says, let's walk down and fuck them all. <laughs> The, so that's a music business. They're so that's the old music money. business. That's the old music business. No, that's but, the, that is the music business that got us in trouble where we no, are. No, no. I think that the point is, if you look at Corin Capital, manages Dave Matthews Band. Okay, he is he has the only act in America from the last 15 years that can still do arena business after 15 years. No one else can. You know, they they come out whatever they the Spice Girls. Spice Girls had to cancel the rest of their tour. Yep. No one wants to go. Okay. I, don't, I couldn't believe it. I'm, I'm embarrassed for my city. We had them even rehearsing there and they sold tickets. I couldn't believe it. You know, first of all, they lie about things, you know. It's like, they lie. You know, Springsteen, Springsteen doesn't sell out every day. The Eagles don't sell out every day. People tend to know now that the Rolling Stones don't sell out every day. The Barbra Streisand tour, okay? I don't want to reveal too many personal names here. You know, somebody calls me up. Anybody you want to go can go. Third row. Okay? You can go. And basically what they told the Barbra is, listen, either you cut the price or you're going to be playing in an empty house and yep. it's all going to get out. So we have a business where there's an artifice that the public can feel. Okay, I'm playing rock band. Everybody here knows it's rock band, okay? And I'm sitting there, 
and I'm, it's more exciting than going to most of these shows and listening to the records, because it's so phony. <laughs> Well, I tell you, I'm only in Guitar Hero, and it ain't exciting for me because I can't do dick on it. <laughs> you know what they say, practice. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I really think that we have a business where everybody says yes. We have, the, we have okay, we have Cartel, the, the band in the bubble. Yep. Remember that? They sold on Militia just about 70,000 records. And I corresponded with everybody, everybody. The guy who's the key, who is uh, in the band, Cartel, the lead singer. And they say, we have no choice. MTV comes to us. In case you're unaware of this, they spent a month in a bubble. It was an MTV show, and they recorded the album. So they put out that fucking album. It sells 23,000 copies. It sells a third of what they did when they weren't on TV. Correct. So if you're the manager, in hindsight, no one gets hindsight, they say, don't do that. So the question is, what other things should we not do? Okay, if, you know, it's, it's hard to explain, uh, thread the needle, but Tom Petty, absolutely, in terms of slam dunk money, now, okay? But what do you do now that impacts your career further down the line? Well, I think you've got to be smart, Bob. I think you've got to be able to look at your act. There's some acts, I think, that don't transfer to television. Just don't transfer. So th why bother doing it? You can't be manipulated by the record company to do that. And there's some acts, I think, that do transfer to television and actually can come, come up off it. I think of bands in the old days, like the B-52s, I always thought transferred to, transferred to TV. Actually, I wanted to go see the B-52s. I didn't buy the records, but I wanted to go see them. Uh, if it wasn't for television, I'd be struggling with Michael. You know that. We've talked about it. He's a TV-friendly artist. He can sit there. He actually, he can sit up here and carry a conversation, okay? Some of these guys, they sit there, they got nothing to say. They're dull, okay? They, they haven't done, they haven't, even, even athletes get media training, okay? They don't say anything, but they, they're taught not to say it. But, but the, uh, the, the, the rock guys, you know, it's like going back to the Supremes. The Supremes, they, they, they knew Barry Gordy wanted to have black music sold to white people. So they had coaches. They had coaches that taught them how to walk, taught them how to eat with a knife and fork and in the right order, and taught them how to do all these things, like finishing school, right? And that's how he got the white market. You, you see, you have to do these things. Yeah, you but gotta, when I you, look at Buble, I see guy who plays the housewives. Housewives lie in bed, they masturbate to Buble, you know. <laughs> They, they, they put on this record, they feel all tingly. That's fine, and that's a business, and I, it's great, but it's not rock and roll. Didn't say it has to be rock and roll, it's show business, though. We're in show business. Yeah, yeah, Forget about it, no, it's in show no, business. No, no. Yeah, we lived through, you and me at least, we lived from 1964 to certainly 1976 with the Boston record at the end of it, the Renaissance. There was one Renaissance, okay, where they painted. They continued to paint thereafter. But we, music used to drive the culture. Correct. If you knew what was going on, you listened to the radio and you played the record. Now, TVs, you can watch the latest thing in the news in law and order before you hear it on a record. You know, the lead time in television and movies, which is shrunk, is still six months to a year and a half. I think that music, we have ultimately, because we're only interested in the money, we have actually devalued the business at large. Okay, we devalued the business, but the people, the, there is more music out there now than you and I ever thought of. My daughter sits up there with 4,000 things on her iPod. I didn't have 4,000, maybe I had, yeah, four, not at 19, I didn't have 4,000 records. I didn't, okay? She knows more about music and different stuff that's going on, but they have no, because she's got it for nothing, because, she, because she's ripped it here, ripped it there, file traded, she has no attachment to it. We had attachment. You had an attachment to Boston. I had an attachment, if you go way back to Elvis, or I had an attachment to, uh, to uh, Boz Skaggs, or I had an attachment to somebody who was singing something that I liked. But that's, that's, that's what I, but I bought the records. I read the back of the jackets. I, my daughter wants to connect me up with her. We try to bond a bit. So she sits there and says, you got to hear this Jay-Z thing where they've got all the Led Zeppelin tracks on it, right? Well, this is how we listen to it. Listen to this, Dad. Bang, you got Jay-Z something. I hear cashmere in the back. Cashmere's running for 30 seconds. How about this one? Bang. You know, and then there's another one. Some other track with rock and roll. Listen to the back for 20 seconds. Bang. What do we listen to? You know, what do we listen to? Like, everybody's got ADD. How long is the song? A ringtone. That's how long the song is. So there's no... So, so people, have, people, have, people have no investment in music. When you invest in music, when you invest it, truly invest in it, you have an invest, invested interest, so you care. And the people now, I think that too many people just don't care about the artist. They care about a song. A song will not have a career, will not give you a career. So that's the problem we have with artists now. And I said, I've said it many times, even before this convention, I would hate to be a young artist now. Because I went down the list, I look, who can break acts? 
Every label can only break one or two acts in three years. It's Warner Brothers, it's Buble. In Capitol Records, it's Corn Bailey Ray. In, and then they got the Hollywood Records with uh, Hannah Montana and the Jonas Brothers. Then you got the Killers somewhere. On that, they're on their label. They got Amy Winehouse on Universal. There's not, there's no, there's no, there's no thing that we used to say. When I was with Loverboy, when I was with Adams, all that, we had a plan. First album, just get in the door. Kick the door open a little bit. Second album, maybe have a hit, get real close. And I remember going to Jerry Moss and saying, Jerry, I got this record, it, it's uh, the, cuts, uh, the, um, uh, the, the third record. And he said, I said, you know, I died on you, you got it, you wanted it, you got it, it was a great record. Jerry, if I don't get a gold record, I want to get off this label, even though I had a contract. And he said, Bruce, if I don't have that record, go gold, I'll let you off the label. Bang, the thing went through the roof, okay? I, but they were, there was a build there. There's always that third album build. There isn't that anymore, Bob. It isn't, and that's what's killing the young you acts. I agree with everything you just said, but I kind of disagree. First of all, I don't believe in the kids being having AD and D, ADD. You I don't? Believe, no, I believe the kids have an unbelievable shit detector. You know, I remember when I used to listen to the AM radio, uh, hello, Louis Armstrong, Hello Dolly came on. Hated it. Hated it. But you push the button, only like two other stations, you'd hear Hello Dolly too. So I had to listen to it. So today, if I had an iPod in 1965 or whatever, I wouldn't listen to Hello Dolly. Okay, so today's kids, they know what's good. We've historically just jammed crap down their throats and they say, no, that's not good. As far as the, the instance you're saying, well, she's playing at 30 seconds, you know, whenever you play music for somebody, I've been with record label, it's a sort of an uncomfortable situation. They'll listen to the whole song. And the other thing, if they're into somebody, there's no limit. It's like, I know vinyl is making somewhat of a comeback, but I know a kid who got into Pink Floyd, he's got all the Pink Floyd vinyl albums, he doesn't even have a record player because he's into Pink Floyd. I think they're into the old acts, they're into Led Zeppelin. Okay, they're not into these new acts, and I don't think it's solely because they changed. And I think I agree with you. It's hard to break an act, but yes, we have to admit. You know, there used to be limited. There used to be a sieve, and it was very hard to get through. Okay, you're there with your third album, cuts like a knife, at A and M Records. A and M Records had a footprint, had relationships at radio. There was a limited number of radio stations. You could see the market. Yep. Now it's like looking through steel wool. You you don't even know what you're seeing. And where to start? And I think that the people who've been in the business for a long time are so greedy, they're saying, you know, it's, it's a Tom Petty thing, but well, my hands are tied. This is the only way I can get the message out. I have to do it this way. Look at Wilco. Wilco, very credible act, relevant in what you think of their music. They made a deal with Volkswagen. The backlash was unbelievable. I don't think that's you know, right. Let me, let me finish. You know, they made it, and the guy said, oh, you know, it's the only way to get our music out. Well, the real story is only your core cares about your music. The person on the fringe doesn't care about Wilco music. Right. So you're doing this and you're alienating your core. You have to balance everything Do you honestly out. believe that your core gets alienated because they did a Volkswagen ad? Absolutely. Do you, you not think their core you, got alienated you, because the you album want, wasn't If that you are big? selling credible stuff. <laughs> Say what again? I don't think people get alienated because they do a Volkswagen ad. I, I, I don't think they get Let me ask you a question. Yeah. What would you think of Terry McBride's Blackberry ad? I, what, I don't buy Terry McBride's crap, so I mean, it doesn't bother me <laughs> at a lot of levels. Okay, I think it's fine. He's just a business guy, he uses a Blackberry. I know he got a bunch of free Blackberries for everybody, but everybody else. I don't care about it. What do I, what do I care everybody about? Everybody in this room is not getting a chance to sell out. We all need heroes. We all need something to believe in. I don't care if it's the 15th century or the 23rd century. The weather technology, it doesn't change. So in the music business, we used to provide people to believe in. We no longer do that. <clears throat> we provide people to believe in, okay? So, and we're still believing in those same people, yours and my generation. Yes. Okay. And they're believing in our generation's acts. Okay. Your daughter probably has our generation on her iPod. Yes, she does. But, the, uh, but what is happening, what is going to happen to our business if this generation doesn't believe in them? Are we just going to have a continual turnover? Is it going to be like the girl groups? Wait, 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 wait. Is that the audience's fault? or the business's fault. Well, there's a lot of things to do with it. When I see people running down the street with an iPod, do you know what I know? I know they're only listening to their music. They're not discovering anything. They put it there. I agree, okay? I agree. I, I listen to satellite radio. I don't have an iPod. Exactly. I've been given more iPods for gifts. I give iPods loaded with stuff. Okay, I don't listen to them, okay? They, they say, we're gonna load it with a bunch of stuff you like. Well, I can do that at home. I can listen to all the stuff I like, okay? I listen to satellite radio. And you know how many times, Bob, I get up and I go over there and I wanna read what, who it is? That's why I discover music. Well, that's what I do, too. Yeah. So I, have, I have both services, and they're really pretty different. And yep. a, that's my filter, and that's where I get turned on. Actually, I'm listening more to Sirius recently because XM doesn't play what people tell you to play, and I feel like I'm living in an alternative universe. No one knows of the acts. <laughs> so I go to Sirius where the reception is shitty, but at least I said, oh, yeah, I read about that act. I read about that act. They're playing the work single. But 
the, the radio, satellite radio as of now is a, is a failure. Commercial radio is a failure. Yep. Television doesn't really play any music videos, okay? So yeah, I think the person who comes up with a way to tell us who the acts we should be listening to is gonna make a lot of money, but I don't think our hands are tight. Instead of railing against all the people stealing the music, why don't they come up with a new discovery uh, system. Why don't they get together and say, these are the five tracks you should listen to. But you know who it is with a fucking radio promotion guy. He thinks everything on my label is good. Everything. And it's not. <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny. It was uh, it's off the record meeting with, uh, with Lior Cohen. And fascinating character. And he goes on and he says, we're not interested in good. We're only interested in magnificent. Which is true. If it's not fantastic, I mean, people, you know, it's like Sarah McLachlan, that's one of Terry's acts. I happen to like Sarah McLachlan. But then people say, oh yeah, Sarah McLachlan, let me change it a little bit. People say, oh, you're an old fart. You just understand, you know, first of all, they say, the music is made for the kids. That's having contempt for the kids. Why are the kids then therefore listening to adult uh, music, i.e. classic rock? The, the point is, it has to be as good as it used to be. Sarah McLachlan is not Joni Mitchell. They're both from Canada, that's about it, okay? <laughs> And so the point, we're looking for people who are great, but we're looking, what we've ultimately found is people either want to be completely alienated and be Vampire Weekend, or they want to be in Paris Hilton and TMZ and on American Idol, and in the middle there's nothing, where it's unseeable. Well, since we're talking about Warner Brothers, of which Lear Cohen is involved in, I, Dermot Quinn came to me and I, we were talking about the business, and I really respect him as a marketing guy. I think he, he's a really bright guy. And he said, as far as he's concerned, he's in the profile business. And that's why I stick with labels. People say, why aren't you trying to get off the labels and just go independent and do this and do that and make $6 an album instead of $2.50 or $2.36 or whatever these guys are making, my guys are making. But I, I still believe I need the label for profile. Now, I had an interesting meeting last week. Four people flew up from Los, from, from Los Angeles, sat down with me from the company. Um, new media department. I went to a new media meeting. It's unbelievable. Okay? I don't even have a computer. I'm sitting at the new media meeting watching these kids sitting there telling me about what's going to go on. And I found it fascinating, and I found it really invigorating when I walked out of there. I phoned Tom Wally, and I said, I really appreciate you sending these guys up here to talk to me. And he says, well, you know, Bruce, we don't call ourselves a record company anymore. We're a music company. And maybe that's good, because if it becomes a music company, maybe we will get more good music. And maybe Leo Cohen's right by saying we look for magnificent, which is better than looking for just shit, some shit to throw out there just to get something out there for some billing. Maybe, they're, they're, maybe he took the time, they took the time to break Buble, to break Josh, but we go down the list to break the act, Lincoln Park, to break, maybe, maybe that's what we need, is somebody to get, to get to care about the music. If they want to, I'd rather than be called a music company to tell you than a record company. Okay, before we make Tom Wall and Jeremy Quinn gods, if you had a new act, <laughs> mm -hmm. they'd want a 360 deal. Yeah, but I wouldn't give them one, and, and you say one thing you write up all the time, Bob, there's going to be guys making 360 deals, the lawyers who made those deals are going to be sued. You say it all the time, and that's a bad deal. Okay, but in terms of their business, you know, that Seth Godin thing that, I, that is really fascinating about Tribe, he said when it comes to these b uh, record businesses, you can't evolve, you have to jump. So I think if Warner Brothers all of a sudden said, we are a music company, okay, and we are just interested in profiling and sharing in all, all streams of revenue, I think that would be good. First of all, it'd be a very small spot of the whole business. Yep. That's the interesting thing, you know, with all these labels, they lay off staff, they cut the number of acts they sell. Meanwhile, everybody can make music and everybody can distribute it. I think just by that, they're minimizing themselves. They're leaving it completely open for a new player who's going to work on sweat equity, who's going to line up all the credible acts I'm talking about who are not going to sell out. Okay, so here, here it's because an act sells out doesn't make them not, make them not credible. Okay, they, somebody offered them some money, they did something. Adams did, Adams did things for Audi. I don't get up and think Adams is all of a sudden un, not credible. You, did, you can mix and match these people. It's nothing wrong with that. You have this stupid 70s hang-up that if you do an endorsement, okay. you're an asshole. Okay, if Bruce Spring... If Bruce Spring... GM's in trouble. Yes. And if Bruce Springsteen made a deal for $2 million, we'll call it $5 million, with GM, to advertise the Pontiac GT6, which... Does, no. To do... They have these minivans, the Saturn Aura. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Pick a okay. minivan. Good. Okay. Saturn Aura. You would say, oh, it's fine, he's just collecting a no, check. No, 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 no. Do you think Bob Seger actually got hurt with Like a Rock? Do you actually Bob think... Seger wasn't working for 10 years. Yeah, so that's because like... he had Like a Rock. <laughs> right. Do you think it really hurt him? No, he went out and sold tickets he's all over He's got a again. manager who's living like in 1950. You talk about not knowing new technology, Punch is like living in 1940s. <laughs> okay? So, but no, literally, let's stay with that. If it's Bruce Springsteen, yep. if it's Peter Gabriel, Chrysler's in trouble. Peter Gabriel, they can use all his music in Chrysler. you say fine? I'd have, I'd have, that to me is strictly an artist's decision. 
I mean, I'm a commission guy. I hate to think I would be bringing it up. Believe me, I'd be sitting there bringing it up. I wouldn't kill it at the source. Okay, and I, I saw what it did with, with Sting with Jaguar. I don't think it hurt Sting. I don't think it hurt him a bit. I think it saved a record. I honestly, I think it killed Mellencamp. I think Mellencamp didn't do anything for him. Right. But, but it was all the timing was wrong. Okay, the well, let's assume they hadn't done the Jaguar thing and Mellencamp was the first person. Because of who Mellencamp was, I think it would have killed Mellencamp too. I don't agree, Bob. I, I, I think if you can sit there, see, Brian sits there all the time. He would love to be able to give his music away free. I have to keep reminding him, you took a huge advance here. You just can't say, well, I give, give away free, thanks for the advance. You want to pay the advance back, go ahead. But I mean, he believes the music should get out there. So if the artist believes that the music can get out there, that's why they put music in films, they might put music for commercials, they might, might put music, whatever. If, if it's up to the artist to make that call. That and I think you can survive it if it's done right. Well, first and foremost, music is free. Brian's music is free. Yeah, it is. He doesn't have to decide yes or no, it's free. So as far as the artist community, they should just accept that. So the fact that you're dealing with the relation, it's like uh, Hits Daily Double, okay? They, did a, uh, they do this cartoon every week, and they're using a song called Liar Liar by the Castaways in the 1960s. They didn't get permission. And I sat there and I said, I'd like to bust these guys on that. But nobody gets permission anymore. So for you to sit here and say, oh, yeah, I'm beholden to the label. Okay. I'm beholden to the label. I'm beholden to the label. If they pay me a bunch of money, I'm all of a sudden we're partners, you know. I sat there last night when I got this award for uh, this award they gave me last night. I mean, I'll tell you right now, Bob, there ain't an act that I've broken in my entire career that I do not think that I was a partner with the record label, that, that I worked with them. Okay, I didn't have these adversive relations with people where I want to kill them. I didn't, okay? I think, you know, that, that the record labels played a big part, as they still do today, in breaking my axe. Martina, Joe Galante's a powerful, powerful guy in, in, in Nashville, Tennessee. I don't want to fight him. Because he, he can just go like that, and all of a sudden I'm on broken bow. I mean, you know, Joe Galante can get things done. I believe that. I believe in, in Bublé out here with Steve Kane, or I believe Dean Cameron with the, the Anne Murray record. There's a record. The biggest record we had since 1977. She's ever had. I was even with her in those days. But I, I believe the team now. I believe the record companies are lean and mean with good people. I believe they're going away. But until they go away, I'm going to try to make, do the best job I can with them. I'm not there just to, just to say, fuck you. Okay, let's okay, talk Martina McBride. Incredibly good-looking, sings mainstream country. What if you represented an act that didn't make music that could get on country radio, but you really believed in the act? Would you sign with a major label then? What could they do for you? No, I, I, I wouldn't sign. I've tried that. I, 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 you know, I, I love Cajun music, so I signed Zachary Richard. Right. Okay, I think this is great. But then I figured it all out. The only time I saw Cajun music really was down in the south, and I was drunk and fucked up, and I thought it was great. I took the records, I took, I took, I took, I took the records home, and I hated it. But I already made, made the deal. And of course, I tried, I, try, I tried to change him to a Main Street act and couldn't do it, and it all went sideways. But I, I think that I can... I, I'm going to sign another act, and I'm going to surprise you. And I'm going to sign an act that I like. And I'm going to take that act, that nobody else is, you know, that people kind of like, and I'll build that act up again. How? By moving him or her a little bit, but staying true to her, who she is, and by busting my ass to do it. And I don't think that's ever changed. That's why I got a small number of acts. I'm not one of these guys who says, here we come, come on in. Yep, we'll sign here. Nice to see you. What are you oh, good. Yeah, I heard your record. It's great. Pete's going to look after you here, and if you ever get a jam, come see me. Okay, and that's why historically, when I look in the business, Elvis Presley, one manager, one act. Uh, uh, same with the Beatles, Epstein, one manager, one act. A few fringe acts, but basically one. You know, the Rolling Stones, same thing. Bruce Springsteen, same thing. John Lando, one act, okay? Sting with Miles Copeland, one act, or the police, one act, okay? And I believe uh, the U2, Paul McGinnis, one act. It goes on and on and on and on and on. And I think this business is about passion. And if the manager can have the same degree of, of passion for the act that the act has, of course, for what, doing what they're doing, I think it's unstoppable. Okay, Bob. <laughs> if we go back to your example, you know, I'm America-centric. So what we have, the only radio format that sells mu uh, records or sells recorded music is Top 40, which is urban and pop. And the last time AC can sell records. What? Hot AC can sell records. Hot AC can sell records. AC can't sell records. Hot AC can sell records. Okay. So what are you going to do if you are you willing to sign an act that's not friendly to either of those formats? If you sign a rock band, I would never sign a band again because I never want to argue with a drummer. But <laughs> um, Bob, I don't think I would sign an act 
that I couldn't get on one of those formats. I have to be honest, I don't think I would just sit there in space trying to do something bizarre. You know, I'm at lunch with Craig Kalman, who runs Atlantic Records, yep. okay? They're still selling records by radio. And the public is listening to less and less radio every year. So it looks kind of like a dying thing. I mean, you, in your particular case, you have four incredibly successful acts. Well, on some level, you're riding the horse, mm -hmm. and you're deciding where to take a pee, and where to stop for the night, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Irving Azoff, okay, Frontline, got a gargantuan operation. There's no developing acts there. But the business depends on developing acts. And for developing acts, there aren't that many opportunities. I know, and it's sad. And this is what I worry about our business. It's really sad. That's why I said there's only six or seven acts. Get through, and, and, and are they gonna have a second album? I mean, I, I'm really, concerned about it and, and, I, and I would not like to be a young musician these days. Luke Lewis told me he's in the business for as long as we both have. Bob and sat there, he says, you know what, Bruce, what? I've never been happy about being old because it's nearly over. I'm not going to have to do this anymore because it's really tough. The, there is young talent coming up and I mean, obviously there is because there is new acts. Amy Winehouse is a new act, okay? Hinder or something like that. They're, they're, they're a new act. There's new acts coming up all the, all the time, but boy, oh boy, it's that pinch in the hourglass is getting tinier and tinier. And I think the only, and I think that's, I think it's the record company's got to put the focus on and the manager has to be as focused as the record company. And these days, Bob, the record companies are only focused on what they can make money with. If they can't make money, they're out of here. I agree with what you say, but it is a, it's not quite a zit on the ass of the business, but it's really reducing. What you found is people who already know how to make money in a reduced world are looking smaller and smaller. So the reason they can only break an act, each company can only, each conglomerate can only break one act is by virtue of the fact they, they're trying to go through that same little sieve, that same little channel, where there's gotta be somebody in this room who's saying, that's ridiculous, I know everybody, I can break a new act. First and foremost, the act must be good. B, it must speak to the audience. C, it has to have a relationship to the audience. Today, acts have relationships with the handlers. Have a relationship, oh yeah, I got my sponsor, you know, I got a deal, I'm on CBS, et cetera. There's, you know, you're talking about, hey, going for the money, going for the money. Today's generation, they're completely turned off. They might like a catchy track. What do you track. think, what, what are they doing here? What are they all sitting here for? Just want to get out of the cold? They want to know how to make some money. I mean, this is, this is, they're in the business. I th I the think, business is to make I think, money. I think, I'm sorry that you hate that, but no, the business is I to think make if money. You're prime, I think if your primary motivation is to make money, it's too hard, people will do me. something else. Okay, I'm not up there just to fool around. Okay, I, so when you start, and you're, you're, you start as a bouncer, yeah. and you're running clubs in Vancouver, your number one motivation was to make money. Absolutely. Absolutely. I wanted to be successful. And successful happens to be, in most cases, determined by how much money okay, you Okay, so personally, I don't want to get into that personally kind of what, what, what have you ever said no to? Because there's got to be things that come to you that have been a lot of money, and you said no. So I passed on heart. They were in my hometown, I passed on heart a long time ago. Because? I didn't get, it just didn't. Oh, that's it's different. Easy. I'm trying to say, how oh. about something that comes to you and you go, you know, it doesn't feel right to me. Um, I've passed on quite a lot of sponsorship things, a lot of them. So why? It's money. But why? Go, because I didn't think. Because I didn't think there was a fit. It, I didn't think there was a fit. You know, um, Martina McBride doing something for. Uh, I got to think about it. You know, stop doing something for alcohol. Okay, great country sponsor, not for her. Okay, they would have paid seven figures, not for her. She has, she has to live with that. She's got three kids. She doesn't sell that image. Pass. Okay, that's how you make that decision. But that's up to her. Alan Jackson, David McGraw, they'll take the liquor sponsorship. Brooks and Dunn, doesn't bother them. They'll take it. Okay, it so, hasn't hurt them. So Brian Adams has a new record. How do you break a new record in America with Brian Adams? I, I think it's, it's going to be very, very tough. Because he, it's like Elton John. Elton John gets discouraged that he can't sell his records anymore. Because people want the old records. That's what they want. The brief Bruce Springsteen. I watch him. Bruce Springsteen, who's a god in America, is limping towards a million copies. And you said to me just a while ago that the other two records didn't get close. Right. Okay? The other thing you said is you said artists have to connect with their fans. And you wrote an interesting piece one day, and I've kept the, some of this stuff because I really agree with it. You said there was a band out there, Bob, and I'm sorry I can't remember, had 600,000 hits on their website. So they figured, rightly so, that if I get another band who had 400,000 hits, and we, you named the bands, you took them, and they went out and they got together and said, we're going to tour America in clubs, not going to do anything outrageous. And all of a sudden, in 300 seat venues, they were doing 100. What happened to the fucking friends? If your friends won't, there's a sign on Terry Rose, my agent's door. If your friends won't pay to see you, then who the hell will? <laughs> you know, what happened, Bob, with that? They had all these friends, all that contact. People listened to their music and nobody about, went. I think we're confused with a couple of things. MySpace friends and then people who actually, there's this act, uh, Corey uh, Smith, okay? And he does unbelievable, it's kind of like a Pat Green act. 
and he goes from does unbelievable business. And I was, you know, the manager is a new friend of mine, and the agent's a new friend of mine, and we talked. They're going to do a couple of million bucks a year, okay? And I discussed it with Jason Flom, and he said, "Hey, that won't pay for the fuel for my jet out here." Okay. That's just a stupid arrogant statement. No, no, no. The point is, that's how the label thinks. The label is not interested in that small thing. Maybe that, that's what's wrong with the label right there. That's not going to pay for my jet out there. Right. That's what's wrong. Okay. And it's still the, it's still the labels. And t- when the labels start taking away Lior Cohen's limo that idles outside his office down there in New York all day long to take him three blocks up the street to lunch, when they get rid of Jason Flom's jet, when they start paying these guys on performance rather than just hanging around going to lunch and making $3 million a year, when they start cutting that fat at the top and, p- and putting it down to the artist and spinning it where it should be, then we'll have a better music business. So, so what do you think about this roll-up with AEG, Irving, Cablevision and Ticketmaster last week. Well, uh, Irving always sells his stuff. Irving rolls up a big thing and then he puts it up for sale. He does it over and over again. He's like the Michael Cole of America. Michael Cole sold his own company up here three, four times. Now he's got to pay attention because the stock's in the shitter, so now he's active all of a sudden. You know, he's like Kirk Kerkorian, who's got all, the, all that stock in, 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 uh, in the Chrysler. All of a sudden, when Chrysler's dying, Kirk Kerkorian wants to take over the board. You remember? Right, absolutely. If, if, I'm gonna, if, I'm gonna, if my company's going to go in the toilet, at least I've got to be driving the bus. Okay? So that's what Irving's doing. I mean, and, and, what, and, what, and what is Irving doing? He's really not helping his acts. Why not? It's not helping your acts. It's just so he can get, you know, if he's got control of a bunch of acts there, he can go up there with Jimmy Buffett and make these deals that you and I have never heard of. I never made a deal where I get 110% of the gate. 110% wait, 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 of the gate. Wait, 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 wait. What's wrong with that? that it's not, it's, but it's, that Jimmy Buffett wins, but the other guys don't win. One oh. guy wins. The right. Eagles always win. Wait, 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 wait. Who doesn't win? First of all, you said he was, he's not, none of this does well for his act. No, so, it's, it's so about I Irving. I Jimmy Buffett and I tour every summer and I get 110% of the gross. Tell me where there's That's a problem. That's one act. Okay, he's got 30, 20 acts, Bob. Okay, but the acts that Irving literally, you know. He no. looks after one, you just said it. Okay, he looks, he looks after, after the Eagles. The Eagles. Okay. And the rest of it, he's looking after no, okay. himself. No, if you look at, if you really look at what's going on here, if he wanted to cherry pick the dates, mm-hmm. he'd go to AEG and work at a certain number of markets, but he could not have a na- national tour. AEG would not buy a national tour. So he had to go to Live Nation. And Live Nation said, you're gonna do shitty in this market, you're gonna do shitty in that market. So we'll cross collateralize the dates. Exactly, so you're gonna make less. But because he's a bastard, like any good manager should be, like you are, he said, hey, if I, if I can get somebody else to bid against this guy, that guy's going to have to pay more. Because Live Nation, at this particular point in time, they say, well, you can either take our deal, or you can go to every individual concert promoter, most of which doesn't exist. There's Don Fox, there's GM, there's not much. You're really stringing together. Isn't this what, uh, what uh, Cliff Bernstein did with Def Leppard in, uh, uh, in your act, Brian Adams, and as a result, lost Def Leppard? Yep. Okay, so the bottom line was he had to go to Live Nation. Okay, now I, he is building something, so I think that is good for his but acts. Does, but Live Nation doesn't help his young bands. Okay, he, Irving only takes on bands that can right. sell t- or s- sort of sell tickets. Right. Okay, so he can make that deal. And, and, and they want Buffett, they want the Eagles, they want Christina Aguilera, they want any number of acts he got. So yeah, you gotta take some of the young stuff with it. But I couldn't break Buble like that. I went with an independent and I know, because I, I wanted a guy who when he got up in the morning, every day, and you've talked to Don, every day he gets up, he thinks about Michael Buble. It, Live Nation is thinking about, I got, the guy in my hometown does 650 shows a year. The Live Nation guy does 650 shows a year. I got a, I, I got a guy who's very company in many, many ways, hangs on to how well he does with my act. That, so now what have I got? I got a passionate record company because they're trying to keep the lights on. I got a passionate manager because that, that's, that's me. I got a passionate promoter who's busting his ass because that's a chance for him. He's going to make him, uh, some big money off of that if it hits. And he, and he cared about me. Okay, he busts his ball, put his money up, and, and I give him all the dates. I don't work any Live Nation dates and without, with, in, in America. I, I, I'm with the guy I, I stuck with, and, he, and it's, worked, it's worked for me. You know what's ridiculous? I stand there, and I said something the other night. I stand at the Bell Center, I stand at these shows. I'm working with the same guys. I'm doing the same thing I did. I did Don Fox with Backman Turn Overdrive. I did Don Fox with Loverboy. I did Don Fox with Brian Adams. I did Don Fox with Michael Bublé. We sell 100 million records I've sold, they told me the other day. I mean, wouldn't somebody in this room get up and say, Wait a minute. This guy's got an answer. I just got to copy it. That's all I ever did. I just looked around. You know why I did a duet album with Anne Murray? Because Tony Bennett did it. You think I come up with this shit? <laughs> you know? So when's the, when's the duet album going to come out in America? Brian? No, no, the uh, Anne Murray. 
It's, it's out in America now. How come I never heard of it, other than from you? <laughs> <laughs> because I think it's a very tough record, but I, Bob, they've, only, they've guaranteed me that we can sell half a million records down there. If I sell half a million when, did, when was the record released? It was released six weeks ago. It's out, it went, debuted at number 40, is the highest record you had in the They debuted at number 40? Yeah, listen, you're talking about- They don't about even print that in the newspaper. They, they did print it up here, believe me. Well, what was the label in America? Blue Note. Bruce, Bruce Lundvall. Lundvall. Was that, my, my good friend- uh, Bruce Lundvall. Bruce Lundvall. Yeah. That's a pretty shitty job. Yeah, but you gotta understand what you're dealing with kind of an artist, you know, that we're not on the radio. How'd you sell all the records here? Marketing. Total, mm -hmm. total marketing. Okay, what'd you do? Not on the radio. What'd you do? Made a deal with, um, what, well, EMI was very aggressive in marketing. We make deals, just get the thing. If you can get her into the stores, the people are gonna buy her. Plus, she's a Canadian icon up here. Okay, so the other thing we did, I thought we made a real smart deal with the Razor Reader campaign of the National Post, the Can West newspapers. And we said, okay, we're gonna go on tour every time when we, we're gonna tour across the coast, in Can coast to coast in Canada, and you'll do the advertising, and we'll take a dollar off our ticket, and we're gonna give you every day. And I tried it with Michael Bublé, it worked the same way. So what I had is profile, because they just, they got space. They'll run a full page ad. They got to run another full page ad. They'll team up with him here. You, they'll do everything. Okay, you got, you got to make people aware okay. of it. That's harder in the United States. Why? Because it's bigger. It's well, what, you know, how bigger. about the old '70s regional model? Start in a region, see what happens. I, 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 you can't do that with Ann. You can't. This is, we just got to make aware of the problem. And the trouble is with the duets record. And Tony Bennett had the same problem: is that you get them in there for the duets record, then television wants the duets. But these duet artists aren't really. They want to save their television moment for them. I understand that. Tony Bennett, the only guy who did a Tony Bennett duets that I remember on TV is maybe, uh, was us, uh, was Michael and probably Diana Krall, okay? And, then when, and when they had the TV show, he just had the people go in after the TV show, it was all over. But the TV show was on once and was gone and rated horribly, came fifth, okay? So my biggest problem is I, I, all the TV in the States they ask for is a duet pro. pro. Is a duet well, partner. Okay, that's I can't the, do that. There's nothing else you can do? She can't go on no, to Oprah and now. say she's gay or something? She's already done that. She's already been on Oprah. But no, it's not a big enough story. It's not a big enough story. You're dealing with a 62-year-old artist, okay, who's getting a real good shot at 62, who's going to sell half a million records in, um, in, in America and going to sell, is now at 140,000 up here. That's all right. I, I'm hearing defeat in your voice. There's nothing you can do. There's, there's, no, there's no other person like Anne Murray. You can't get her on some award show. You can't she's, do something oh, to raise your oh, profile. She'll be on the award shows. You'll see her on the CMA Awards this year. You'll see, she'll be in the Junos this year. You know, she'll, she'll be, she does what she does. Okay, but it's really difficult for me to get her on to some of these shows. And I admit it, unless I take a duet partner with me. And some of these duet partners, like Shelby Lynn. Now, you're Shelby Lynn. Okay, so you put out your album of Dusty Springfield's hits. Okay, you put out your album. I said to, to, to Luke Lewis, I can take her and put her on every TV show. We'll be on, we'll be on The View, we'll be on this, we'll be on that, we'll be at Regis and Kathy, all those, Kelly, all those people that sell records. She didn't want to do it. Well, she's a moron, okay? Because that was her, t that was her, that was her shot to get on. Absolutely. Okay, you could have sold both records. Exactly. It's right. ridiculous. But I mean, I have to deal with these idiots, okay? They didn't see it. And I, Bob, we were there. And that's why you're not going to get Shania Twain. I'm right. not going to get Celine Dion. I'm not going to get Nelly Furtado. I'm not going to get any of the people that are on that record. But Shelby Lynn, she should have been singing there. We could have broken that. You sing Dusty Springfield. We'll do a duet together. It'll be a great night. And everybody can sell the stuff. And she, and now look at her record. Just zoom. You'll Unbelievable. See. Thank. Yeah. Because no, no vision. No vision from her. It was sad. Well, she's, you know, isn't she have a relationship with her manager? I don't know. Yeah, that's what I mean. She's got, you know, I think you really need a great manager. You know, David Krebs used to go on about this. He says, behind every act, great act is a great manager. Do you agree with that? I agree with that 100%. You know, because there was this act, you know, there was this, uh, these guys, Madison House, this guy, Mike Luba, who just went to work for Michael Cole, actually. And they had this band, the String Cheese Incident, wasn't necessarily that good, but they were playing theaters. And they were using top-notch guys to make their records. They claimed to be selling 300,000 records on every one, maybe 100,000. But they had cruises. They had all that stuff. They were making money. I yep. think that that is the new model. The but, new model isn't trying to get through the narrow sieve that the major label is trying to get through to carry their overhead. It's about basically trying to get all these different revenue streams, being in bed with your audience, and hoping to get lucky because you're good. Yeah, but String Seas Incident, the way, that guy, that was his life, that act. Right. Okay, and he came up with all those concepts. Right. Because that's all he was thinking about. Right. Again. Exactly. That's, that's, that's great. And I don't, he probably wasn't a great manager when he got there, but he became a great manager. But I, isn't that the future as sure opposed to Irving? Doubt, Irving is. is just signing acts, you know, and finding ways to build with Live Nation and AEG. Yep. Okay. But in terms of developing acts, 
Who is going to develop? I mean, it's easy for you to sit here and say, okay, it's tough for a new developing act. But one thing we know is there will be new music. Correct. People will develop it. People will pay for it. People will go to see these acts. So everybody over the age of 50 who's running the business now is just saying, hey, you know, that's it. But why would you want to be a young act with me? Okay, because you know you're going to be behind four people. You know. Everybody's but don't you have a young act? Well, Michael Bublé is my youngest no, act. No, I thought you had this band. What? I don't have bands. I'd given up on bands. Wasn't there with the one on RCA? No. I thought you said, well, okay. Not, not that I, oh yeah, that, for a minute, I was drunk. Was, <laughs> and, and no, it was with, it, 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 I, I'll do it for a favor for a friend of mine to get involved with this act for Bob Brock, asked me if I would help out, and, and you know what, I couldn't help him. I couldn't help him. Because the record company wasn't gonna make, Clive Davis? You wanna take a rock band to Clive Davis? No, not a hope. So do you think Clive's as good as the, he says he is? No, I don't think he's good as he says he is, but I know one thing. He's another guy who can focus on a project. Like, he's going to focus on Whitney, and he's going to rebuild Whitney, and he's going to bring her out, and it's going to do pretty good. He, he's that type of guy. And he, he wants, and you know what? He's sitting there, if you do it Clive's way, and you know what Clive's like, and he, I know he's got no catalog business and all the rest, and all that's true, but if he's going to focus on that, he'll break that act. Alicia Keys. I think Alicia Keys is dead average. Absolutely. Okay, I believe that. But he's done such a job with her. She's a, I'd look today, she's going to get $3 million. Yeah, but isn't that what's wrong with the business? <laughs> Somebody's buying, I talked to my, no, I no, talked no. to friends, wait, they, wait, they wait, like the record. Wait, if they wait, like wait, the record, no. who am I if to tell them? they're selling they $3 million albums in a country of 300 million. Well, nobody's selling like they used to do. That record now is But my point is, what, what we have is, we have an extremely average act, which all the media is complicit with. And I think that the audience, the people in this room, are tuned out. The people don't, don't take this seriously. They, they can immediately tell, oh, this is being hyped. This is, these people are in bed with this one, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why they don't believe. When you used to go to the venue in the 60s or the 70s, you were there with the act and the promoter. That was it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying we should return exactly to that era, but I think it's really about saying no. You say all publicity is good publicity. Is all, publi all this publicity helping Britney Spears? I don't see how. I think we have all these old saws, like do television, et cetera. Or, you know, get your song, you know, we were laughing earlier at lunch, you know. It used to be get on the OC. The OC is gone. You know, there's these get acts. On, get it on Grey's Anatomy. Yeah, yeah, it's like, you know, they're on these shows and it almost doesn't make any difference in, anymore. So I think it's easy to say, hey, what's left of the business? This is how you should run. But the more fascinating thing is, how about this incredibly murky area of new talent, new development, et cetera? No one in here is going to sit here and testify commercial radio is good. Not a single person, okay? So we're just going to say, hey, that's the way it is? So I think the more fascinating thing is to look at these other areas. You know, there was a story in the, uh, in the Los Angeles Times last week. 38% of teenagers never bought a CD. Never bought a CD in the last year, okay? Now, I believe you don't... It's like your point about major labels. If they can help me now, great. But you can see the movie. Oh, you can see you it. Know, you know, we're not going to be able to sell any CDs pretty soon. Correct. And selling by track, you know, they're just busy suing people. So I don't think the future lies with the old players. But the future, is, the future, is the CD is going away is dead, dead correct. I mean, I know that. And, you know, it's guys. That's why David Foster, one of the greatest producers of all time, running around trying to be a TV host, because he knows he used to make his, he, he used to make all his money on royalties. Now a big seller for him is four million. Right. He's used to twenty six million. That changes your whole lifestyle. But isn't that a different point with Foster that really you can only do one good one thing well? <laughs> well he's gonna try to be, you know, he was pissed off that Drew Carey got that Bob Barker show. Yeah, he's never gonna he's, yeah. he's delusional. Yeah, I know. But he, that's what he wants to be now because he knows he has to do it's something. Exactly, but, he has to be, but the point is it's just like these these, you know, Madonna is an actress. Terrible. Okay? Nelly Furtado, these people want to be, even Alanis Morissette is going to be here. She's better, you know, they can't make it. Mick Jagger, terrible actor. You're lucky if you can do one thing well and you've got to focus on that one thing. Okay, so I'm saying there is going to be new music. But somehow, and I don't know how to do it, obviously, but we've got to get away from where it's about the song. It's somehow we've got to get back to the artist. And there is going to be an artist breakthrough. There's always some artists that break through. I bump it, but it's, I think it's the hardest thing to do to make it about the artist. Wait, wait, I don't think so at all. I think that, that the business has made it about the song. They take that same song and whore it out for ringtones. They make endorsement deals. They bang it down your throat with sponsorship. They bang it on radio, etc. You know your, some of your favorite records. Van Morrison, it was never about the track. Never about the track. And radio accepted that. And then even after he peaked, by the time he hit 1978 or 9 with Wavelength, etc., that was like the last single. Okay, so People let's go to a new act today. Okay. Let's go to a new act today coming over. Canadian girl. Feist. Okay. Semi-broken. Did it. Sold about three, 400,000 records in the U.S. What do you say it's from? You know what it's from. It's from that Apple commercial. Okay, it's from a commercial. But, but the point is, what does it mean in the future? Not much. So what, she got in the goddamn door, Bob? 
Yeah, but she's selling that broken social scene thing. It's just you know, totally about credibility. My point is, Feist, it's a novelty track, done. So you think she's a novelty act? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. I'm not a fan, but I mean, I think there's more there than that. One, two, three, four. You know, you're going to compare that to Stairway to Heaven? You know, Joni Mitchell? One, two, three, four. <laughs> But, but what we were talking about, what we were talking about is, can you break an act? Feist has partially I, I think an act is something, somebody that your friends know about, that you spread the word, that you grow from the bottom up as opposed to the top down. One thing I know about Feist is the iPod it plays on is light years more credible and cooler than she is. Well, okay. Let me ask you a question. Yep. Okay. You want to fuck Feist? No. No! You know, that's not a rock star in no, my book. No, no. And, there were, and there were plenty of ugly, you know, Jan, Janis Joplin was not attractive. Laura Nero was not attractive, but there was something in their music. He said, you know, I'd like my shot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to, I, you were talking about Feist, and I lost my train of thought, but I didn't want, I, I didn't want to interrupt. But I think with Feist, it's what she does next. What can she do? Well, let's wait and see. What? No, Why are you like... counting her out now? Wait, wait, wait. Apple? The Beatles sang, she loves you. Yeah, 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 no, yeah. No, no, and look what no, happened. No, 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 no. <laughs> if you want to know who's going to do something next, you look at what Steve Jobs is going to do next. Not an act. Steve Jobs, the iPhone, it's like heads exploding. Okay? And then he comes out with the MacBook Air. It's a, that's like, well, that's a rock and roll act. First of all, what about Steve Jobs? We'll not discuss new product. We'll not discuss it. And the day he releases it is the day you can buy it. Yep. Okay? And it's limited for it's all the rules that we used to have in the music business that we've abandoned. We're Microsoft. Make it shitty, make sure, make it a monopoly, make people buy it, and fuck you, you have no alternative. And the public is saying, hey, we don't okay. like that. Yeah. They're saying it. But you know, Steve Jobs at least got the music out there. We, kids weren't going to go into stores anymore and buy CDs. It wasn't going to happen. I think that's good, but the point is, Steve Jobs is cool. You know, Steve Jobs is the guy, you read the stories where it's designed, and he goes, you know, 1% is wrong, forget it. Whereas, you know, we, in the music business, because there's so much information out there, Clive Davis tells Kelly Clarkson, can't release the record. Actually, it probably is a pretty smart decision. It's a shitty record. Exactly. Well, she's a pop up But the point is, where she was coming from, she was the wrong act, is basically, you know, from the 70s, when you were working with Jerry Moss, did Jerry Moss tell you what to put on the uh, Brian Adams record? No, records? he did not. No. He said, you're the artist, we trust you. We're in business with you, but, but we trust you. we had you. A&R guys who shaped us and molded yeah, us. But now we have all these labels that basically say, until you make it what we want it to be, we won't release it. And they only get the kind of people who are malleable to begin with. And as a result, what you end up with is, yeah, people See, only want the track because there's nothing else there. I'll argue that to a certain extent, Bob, because I think the labels have a big problem in wanting to be cool. Okay? That's their problem. Right. And I mean, even when I was making the Anne Marie duets record, people at EMI wanted to have Feist on it. I didn't want Feist on it. That's not right. If you're not, not smarter than everybody who works at EMI, okay, I mean. Okay, okay, so they don't want that. Now, the next thing is, is the next thing is, is that, is that um, the cool factor. I think hurts the business. The band that gets kicked around all day long for not being cool is Nickelback. That was my story in the green room. Okay. You stole <laughs> but, it from me. But, 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 Nickelback, but Nickelback, I think there isn't a label, if they got a brain, there isn't a label in this world that wouldn't want their Nickelback. Well, the point is we have Gretchen Wilson, okay, who did that one yeah, big yeah. hit. But that okay. was just a... No, 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 hang in there. That's yeah. not my point. I'm reading that, you know, that culture bible known as Parade Magazine. And she says she grew up in Missouri and... The one album, they asked her what her favorite album was. Her favorite album was Back in Black. Yep. It was on every jukebox in every country bar. Okay? The bottom line is America wants rock and roll. And your point is, everybody at the top, they want something edgy and different. It's yep. supposed to meat and potatoes. Nickelback, straight up, even Buck Cherry, which is even edgier than Nickelback, they're selling tons of product because the audience wants rock and roll. They want rock and roll, and the only rock and roll they're really getting right now, Bob, outside of Nickelback, is you gotta go over the country mark. Kenny Chesney's a rock and roll act. Exactly. Uh, Rascal Flax is a rock and roll act. They're just rock and roll acts. Absolutely. Okay? And you're right, at 12 o'clock in the country bar, they listen to all their stuff, and all of a sudden at 12 o'clock, ACDC, Led Zeppelin, and uh, Def Leppard. Pounds right. out of there. Right. It's the same audience, and that's why I'm gonna take Adams. 
Kenny Chesney called Adams up to see that he'd come down and do some work with him, like st uh, uh, on one of his shows. Come on, sing his songs with Kenny. Okay, well, well it'll be a big night. You, you watch. Have, you no. watch what'll happen in front of that country audience. Okay, so Chesney does his stadium tour every summer. Yes. Adams will go on that tour. Adams will maybe go to a date or two. Yes. Sammy Hagar's going to dates. Yeah, I'm not going out in the whole goddamn. Wait, wait, wait. Joe Walsh did a couple dates and then yeah, he can't. Joe Walsh and Brian Adams. No, it doesn't no, matter. No, the guy's Bri one why, so why doesn't Brian Adams do like ten dates? I would go for that, <laughs> but Ch Chesney doesn't work enough. Brian wants to work ten shows in twelve days. Kenny doesn't do that because they're stadium dates. He only works like on the weekends anyway, so Brian yeah. could shoot no, photos no, during the yeah. movie. <laughs> I'd love to put it together, Bob. Believe me, I, I'd love to put that together, and I, I keep pissing in Brian's ear about it. But what does Brian say? I don't think Brian. I don't think Brian's sure yet about whether that's the right thing to do. We see that sign there. <laughs> they okay, sent a guy up first, and nobody paid attention. To <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I get that what the sign says. What the sign says is they don't want to embarrass you. It says wrap. So we got to wrap it up. But I hope you guys. I hope we. And at least entertain you people. Hope you heard some stories. I hope you enjoy the rest of the convention. This man's a great man. You make sure you read it. Read his blog. Thank you. Thank you.